Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing the 40th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And in that war, uh, joint forces from the Egyptians and the Syrians attacked Israel on the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. And yet against all odds, Israel survived thanks to God's deliverance. And this is her story. To uh, discuss the uh, story we're talking about today, which is the Yom Kippur War of 1973, I'm joined by Zami Unstorfer uh, from uh, Lakud Harut UK and uh, Robin Benson from Christian Friends of Israel. Uh, Zami, it's good to have you back on the Middle East Report. And on behalf of the Middle East Report and Revelation TV, we want to wish you and the Jewish community uh, a Shana Tova for Thank the you. new Jewish year. And also you're in preparation for uh, Yom Kippur, uh, which, yes, will be, much so. well, which will be on Shabbat, the day after the first recording of the uh, Middle East report. Um, can you share with our viewers um, why Yom Kippur is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar? Well, Yom Kippur is written in the Torah that it's a day of repentance and where we must fast for, it's a 25-hour fast, no eating, no drinking, and we are all of the time in the synagogue praying. Um, of course, not everyone is religious, but it was very nice to read last year um, that the number of Israelis who um, actually attended a synagogue on Yom Kippur was the highest it has ever been. At some point in the day, people recognize that they, there is a higher power and that they have a, a higher duty than going to do whatever they do. Um, so it's very, very important to, to us. and. Um, it's a very special day. And even though it's hard not to eat, not to drink, and to sit in the same place and not run around um, doing whatever one normally would like to do on a Saturday, um, the fact is one emerges from that enormously enriched, purified, um, and uh, tremendously empowered. And uh, I think empowerment is how we came out of the 73 war, ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's incredible being in Israel for Yom Kippur because the whole nation shuts down. And uh, it's amazing to see so many children then take to the streets with their bikes and their skateboards. Uh, and it's almost as if the whole nation just comes to a complete halt. I mean, the only similar thing we have in, in here in the UK is Christmas Day, but not to the extent of what happens in Israel. And, and clearly this is passed on from generation, but it's also a command, isn't it, in, in the Torah? that everyone should cease from work and fast. Yes, yes. It says you should basically make yourself suffer on that day. Uh, and everybody has their own way of suffering. For some people, not going to a football game is suffering. And to others, you know, fasting um, and, and praying is. Uh, but as I say, it is, um, I, I don't think we would be the, the nation that we are without having that one special day in the year. Mm. You know, I deal with lots of people in business. And no matter how, how distant they are from religion. Um, if they're Jewish, they will say Shana Tova or that they can't attend a meeting on that particular day. Sometimes Yom Kippur falls during a working weekday, um, but they're reluctant to, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, keep that as a normal day, um, however de detached they are from religion. So it's a very, very special day. Uh, and, and Robin, it's important that we remember this uh, Yom Kippur because uh, this year marks the 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Yom Kippur War of uh, 1973 in which uh, Israel was attacked on the 6th of October. And according to my notes here, it was a surprise attack and that Israel faced uh, a force equivalent of entire NATO force of Europe. And on the Golans, Israel faced 100, uh, had 180 tanks and they faced an onslaught of 1,400 Syrian tanks. And on the Suez Canal, Israel only had uh, 500 troops stationed there together with three tanks facing an Egyptian army 
of 60,000 men, 2,000 tanks, 550 aircraft. Um, and yet Yom Kippur, at, the, at this war, Israel faced the prospect of uh, a really annihilation, didn't they? They did, yes. And I mean, the notes that I was reading through pointed out that many of these troops that are actually on both of these two borders weren't you know, um, combat troops, they were like cooks and administrative, you know, folk who were just filling in the gaps while the combat troops were, most of them were back home with their families, going to synagogue, uh, as, as Ami uh, mentioned, on this holiest day in the Jewish calendar. So, bless them, you know, the ones who had to face the initial onslaught from both sides, you know, were probably even less combat aware and ready than the ones who would normally be there. And as I'm sure the, the, the story in, in this program will unfold, we will see that in so many cases, there are clear evidences of God intervening on behalf of the troops. You know, many of them rushed to the front to try and stem this inflow from both, both sides, but God clearly intervening and just turning the whole thing around. I mean, it is, it is again, in Israel's history, it is one of the marvelous stories that, you know, certainly from the Christian perspective, indicates that God has not forgotten his people and that he is heavily involved in what is going on even today in the midst of all of this upheaval that we're seeing, you know, right at the present time. God is actively involved, uh, protecting them, working out his purpose that they are playing a central role in. No, absolutely, and we'll discover that more as yeah. the program progresses. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Zalmi, uh, what are your memories of the uh, Yom Kippur War of uh, 1973 that took Israel by complete surprise? Well, I was in London. I was in early 20s. Uh, I remember um, um, I was in the synagogue, obviously. It was towards the end of the day. Um, and, of course, you know, being in the synagogue and being the holiest day, we don't use telephones, we don't have anything, even in those days we didn't have any mobile phones, but there was no, no one was listening to radios and so forth. And it was the non-Jewish caretaker who, who just told people who, was, who were going out for a breath of fresh air, you know, there's some trouble in Israel, there's, there's a war started. And that's the first in intimation that we had. Um, we all felt, you know, after, with memories, recent memories of the 67 war, that, you know, this would be something that we could endure and overcome. We were miffed that at the idea that they should do it as a surprise attack on Yom Kippur. Um, but um, events then unfolded at a, at a very, very remarkable pace. We didn't have the kind of instant reporting and embedded reporting mm -hmm. that we have today. Mm -hmm. we, you know, it, it, news didn't come out as quickly mm -hmm. from those areas. And being a surprise attack, it wasn't as if there were too many journalists already there waiting to cover it. Mm. So it was a very strange way in which um, it, it, it was only afterwards, well into the recovery period, that we realized just how serious um, the initial onslaught had been. Mm. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that's called The Reality of the Yom Kippur War of uh, 1973. Mm. In September 1973, Israeli intelligence observed a buildup of forces along the Syrian and Egyptian front lines. It was not viewed seriously. A month before the war, we got similar information. And the army and the leadership took it very seriously. And then nothing happened. So when it came the second time, it wasn't taken seriously. At 2 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, Egypt and Syria launched their onslaught. Tens of thousands of Egyptian troops crossed the Suez Canal. Most of the Israeli line of fortresses along the canal collapsed. The Egyptian forces appeared unstoppable. They had the feeling that they are winning our forces for the first time, suddenly felt that they cannot stop the Egyptians. The morale was so high of everyone, even who lost his sight, even who was with amputated legs, but very happy that he has done something for his country. In the north, Syrian artillery troops and armor blasted Israeli positions on the Golan Heights. 
Israeli tanks were outnumbered 10 to 1. The north of the country was at risk. Israeli armored forces stormed across the Sinai Desert to retake positions. But Sagar rockets fired by Egyptian infantry proved deadly against the Israeli tanks. Previously undefeatable Israeli pilots now faced a new reality. Egyptian SAM missiles brought down dozens of Israeli jets. I remember coming to the canal when I arrived in my uh, division after 24 hours of uh, going without tanks across the desert on chains. I saw a young officer. You know, he said he looked at me, he was, you know, was like that. Um, <laughs> as he could not believe, he said, we cannot stop them. We cannot stop them. Egyptian and Israeli tanks engaged in the Sinai. It was the largest clash of armor since the World War II Battle of El Alamein. The Egyptian advance was contained. In the north, Israel turned the Syrians back to the 1967 lines and then continued to push deep into Syrian territory. The turning point in the south came when General Ariel Sharon decided to attack the Egyptians from the rear. The building of the bridgehead across the Suez Canal took place under a massive artillery barrage. It was a terrible night. I think that that night we lost, for my division, about 300 killed and uh, around 1,000 wounded. And all of us from soldiers to the divisional commander, we all were fighting there. It was maybe the most terrible night I've ever seen. Sharon's plan succeeded. Israel advanced into Egypt, cutting off tens of thousands of Egyptian troops in the Sinai. A ceasefire came into effect. The price of war had been devastating. 2,700 Israelis killed and thousands more wounded. More than 18,000 Arab soldiers had lost their lives. It was war, really, of soldiers. Because the courage and the sacrifice that they had to show was unbelievable. They did it. I speak about uh, fathers of four and five and six children who were fighting. And I may call it even the war of fathers and sons. That history Israeli and Egyptian record. officers signed a ceasefire. One day, that the initial step towards understanding, reconciliation, and peace in the Middle East began here at kilometer 101. The 1973 war left Israelis grim and somber. The dead and wounded, the grief and shock had taken a heavy physical and psychological toll. Soldiers and officers returning from the front were bitter. Many staged demonstrations. They asked who was responsible. Welcome back to Middle East Report. And as you saw that uh, from that clip there, that Israel really did fight a war for very own survival during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Um, Zami, many of the enemies of Israel uh, accuse Israel of being uh, a military superpower oppressing the Palestinians. And yet we see with this war in 1973 that Israel faced incredible odds um, thanks to the Soviets who were supplying arms and weapons to the Egyptians and also to the Syrians as well. How close did Israel come to annihilation during that war? I think um, there are a lot of theories about what went on. There's no, no, there's no question that every military person that's analyzed this war um, cannot understand how mm -hmm. we possibly survived that war. So. It just feeds into my own and I'm mm. pretty sure mm. your own feelings that everything that happens in that region um, is divinely led. Mm. Um, the fact, the idea that we are a military oppressors um, is, is laughable. 
because within the same month of that um, war coming to an end, Abba Iban had made an offer to retreat back to the 67 lines in Syria and to retreat back to the 67 lines um, in, um, in Sinai and go back to the pre-67 lines in Sinai. Um, not necessarily to do that with Jerusalem significantly, mm -hmm. if there were to be peace. And the answer that came back was no, no negotiation, no recognition, mm -hmm. um, and um, the three no's. I can't remember what the third one was. Uh, no peace, no negotiation, no recognition. Yeah. Exactly. That was 67, wasn't it? October yeah. 1967. Yes. That was in yeah. the aftermath of the 63. Yes. Yeah. And the same answer came back after the 73. And the 73 war was really Sadat looking not to win a war. He didn't expect, nobody expected to win a war against Israel. It was participating. It was national pride, like Jihan Sadat said in that interview. Mm -hmm. she, you know, he wanted to get pride back. Yes. I don't think he was a NASA that wanted to throw Jews into the sea. Mm. Um, and no one was more surprised than him at, you know, the, the gains that were made and the unpreparedness of Israel, mm. which was a mixture of a surprise and unwillingness by Golda Meir to do a preemptive strike, as, mm -hmm. as was the case in 67. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, that's a, a, a probably an important part, that's a point that Zami's made. That, you know, again, we forget that in the Middle East, there is this whole concept of honor and not being humiliated. And therefore, Sadat and Hafaz uh, Assad were both in positions of having been dishonored in the eyes of not just the Arab community, but the whole world, you know, after the 67 situation. And there really was, uh, they felt this desperate need to set the record straight. Uh, and that seems to have been one of the prime goals in, in this the build up to the conflict. Okay, it unfolded in other ways after it started. But that seems to be one of the prime motivations. And we forget that to our cost today, because it's still the same. It's part of the, you know, the, the Arab psyche not to be dishonored. And we have some of this playing out again before us in the various you know, areas of tension in the Middle East at the present time. No, exactly. And it's also important to remember that the Arabs as a whole, culturally, on, they consider honor yeah. more important than they do Far peace. more important than anything so else. So it's a completely different yeah. value system that yeah. we're facing. Um, Zami, I just want to bring you in on this one, that on the uh, at 5 a.m. on the 6th of October, which was Yom Kippur, the day the war started, uh, IDF General uh, David al who was the chief of staff, uh, recommended that, uh, that to Golda Meir, who was then the Israeli prime minister, to take immediate action, immediate call up of Israeli, of mm. Israeli troops, and uh, also to prepare Israeli forces for a preemptive military strike. Um, but Golda Meir said, uh, no, we must absorb attack first, um, in fear of the United States disapproving of preemptive military action by Israel, but also to show the world that what Israel was facing was a, a just war. Do you think she made the right decision then? In retrospect, no. In retrospect, Israel should never, ever be surprised in any war. Israel must always take the preemptive action because it is so small and it is surrounded by so many enemies. In, mm. this, in this case, it was virtually, you know, every Arab state. I mean, it was the mm. Saudis, the Moroccans, yes. the Tunisians, yeah, all, the, the Algerians. They were, all, they were all contributing to these forces. It exactly wasn't just right. Egyptians and Syrians. Exactly right. I yeah. think in terms of it was like nine nations that were, yes, uh, right. that were even more than in, in, the, mm. in the 48 war. Mm. Um, and it's, it, it's incredible how quickly these nations, we look at it from today, how, how quickly these nations um, become cohesively involved in a fight yes. against Israel, mm -hmm. but they are completely at sea yes. when things are happening in Syria. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the focus is always the Jews, and if there's a way of annihilating them, everybody's in the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, another of my enduring memories um, of, 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 of the 73 war was even at the age of 22, seeing the, what I consider to be Jew hatred of European countries who were refusing to allow American mm -hmm. planes, yeah. who were refueling and refitting Israel mm -hmm. to land in their airspace. Mm -hmm. And that really was a lesson that, that, that really struck home for me. Mm -hmm. I really felt, I mean, living in England, you know, I said, well, you know, wh why would they not? Why, why are they allowing Israel to bleed dry and why are they not allowing America, yeah. you know, the, free, the, 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 the leader of the free world to resupply mm -hmm. their ally? That, that is a lingering memory for me, mm. and it's still going on. Yeah. No, sadly. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now that uh, looks uh, at 
the uh, miracle that occurred during the Yom Kippur War of 1973, and we see the hand of God's protection over the nation of Israel. The Syrian front opened on a disastrous turnover. Emek Habacha, the Valley of Tears, Avigdor Kahalani, the Tzvika unit. The Syrians advanced to the Mount Mine of the Golan Heights, the Benat Yaakov Bridge. There, they stopped. Why did they stop? Why did they continue their attack? The Syrian soldiers have taken along civilian clothes. The Syrians had promised that, God forbid, they would invade the land and take our daughters. Syrian officers told them to take civilian clothes along with them and invade Yaffa, Tel Aviv, Haifa, and Tiberias. But a miracle happened. They stopped in the mountain line of the Golan Heights. A Victor Kahalani said, I was alone, only three tanks, and I stopped 150 Syrian tanks. The War of the Judgment Day, a time when a person is at one with his Creator, a time when God says to his sons, Dear sons, I want to redeem you, a time when they stood in synagogues and yeshivas praying the afternoon prayer, a time of the priestly blessing, for your thoughts are not my thoughts. The Egyptians thought if they attacked Israel on Yom Kippur, they would be victorious. But the complete opposite happened. On Yom Kippur, we were on high alert. Everyone was in the synagogues. War, war shouts in the synagogues. Did we thank our Lord? We began to give thanks. The nation of Israel began to realize their great mistake, and many began to repent and return to their heritage. Or Chaim, Or Sameach, Machon Meir, Yeshivas, for those who returned to their heritage. People began to open their eyes and recognize the holy name of God in the War of the Judgment Day. But the question remains to this very day. How could it be possible that the Syrians were stopped on a mountain line of the Golan Heights? The answer was recorded during an investigation session conducted by the Secret Service while interviewing an officer of the Syrian 9 Division. Why did you stop on the line in the Golan Heights? The officer answers, I'd like to see you cross that Syrian line after seeing a long row of white angels standing on the line and a white hand descending from the heavens motioning to you. Stop, I stopped. Israeli soldiers who saw the Syrians standing in a row as if one tank had scared off an entire division of the Syrian tanks didn't know the answer. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. And it's incredible to see the hand of God protecting his people during this incredible crisis that Israel faced during the Yom Kippur War of 73. Uh, Robin, really, what does this say about the God of Israel that uh, in this real battle for her very own survival in 1973 in which Israel faced incredible odds for her survival. Just mm. the sheer mass of forces that were gathered against Israel. Mm. And yet here we see uh, the Syrian tanks couldn't cross deeper into the uh, past the Golan Heights mm -hmm. because of uh, divine protection. Mm -hmm. What does that say about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Well, I, I think what it says to us primarily is that for those of us who take the, the Hebrew scriptures seriously, uh, and where we read repeatedly in those scriptures that God has promised to, yes, restore his people, which, you know, happened pre-1948, but that once they're back, he would protect them. Uh, now, you know, there, there were many soldiers died, injured during this war, but the nation as a whole was protected. And so f for me and for many Christians, we see that as evidence, again, that, that we can rely upon our Bibles, the, the, you know, the, the, what's written in our scriptures, that God keeps his word. And, and it's a reinforcement to us personally that the promises that are made that we as Christians ha have taken on board, therefore, are also trustworthy because God has consistently kept his word, you know, from, from the call of Abraham right through to the present day. Yeah. Uh, and, and Zelmi, um, you know, it's, your, your nation is such a precious nation. And uh, we know from our own scriptures how important Israel is to God and how important the Jewish people are. Um, and yet nothing really could have prepared Israel for this horrendous attack that happened on the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. Um, doesn't this give you confidence to know that God is actually looking after you and the nation of Israel? Yes, I mean, I feel very, very strongly, the older I get, the more I see, 
um, that the laws of physics tend to break down um, <laughs> over Israel. And it's a little bit like the Bermuda Triangle, but in a real sense. Um, I mean, just bringing it into the modern day context, I mean, I think of these people who in 767 and 73, certainly the Syrians, mm. they always wanted to throw us into the sea. They wanted to drive the Jews into the sea. Mm. And now, after the um, upheaval in Egypt, we had a crisis a couple of years ago. The Muslim Brotherhood took over and they shut off the gas to um, Israel, mm. which was you know, written into the treaty. Israel had no, had no gas resources. Mm -hmm. And how is it that <laughs> just at this epoch mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. we find these enormous gas reserves mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean? Mm -hmm. And now the very sea which they wanted to throw us into, they're now going to say, yeah. you know, we'll add that back as well. Yeah. I mean, we t there's, a, there's, a, there's a verse which says, Fanasati gishmeichem beitam, I will give you the rains in mm -hmm. your time. Mm -hmm. And we get the rains when we want them. Mm -hmm. And yes, we are being looked after, but we are just an instrument of God. Our, we're, we have a mission, a divine mission, mm -hmm. to spread the word of God mm -hmm. and to, to do tikan, to, tikkun olam, to, mm -hmm. to repair the world. And let's face it, the world is pretty broke at yeah. the moment yeah. in all many respects. Mm -hmm. So um, we're just the, the messengers and we are just mm -hmm. the people who have got, have been chosen for that. Mm -hmm for that um, Isaiah mission to basically um, uh, take the light mm -hmm. uh, to the other nations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and we've got another remarkable uh, clip to show you that happened, uh, just shows you the incredible providence and protection of God during this really, really dangerous war for Israel in uh, 1973. קדימה. לפעול בזהירות.
Welcome back to the Middle East Report. And uh, who says that God doesn't do miracles these days? Uh, Robin, I, I, I think that clip was incredible. <laughs> but what it does demonstrate, doesn't it? More importantly, uh, for us Christians, shows us the power of prayer yes. and why we need to constantly keep mm-hmm. Israel in prayer, yes. to, to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, yes. uh, and, and really shows you God's protection over his land and his people. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, I, I've been in meetings recently where, you know, there is a heightened awareness, obviously, because of what's happening in the Middle East at the present time. Uh, that God is challenging those who love him and, and follow him to be more persistently in intercessory prayer for Israel and its people, all of its people at the present time, because there's just so much uncertainty. You know, we still don't know, really know what the, <laughs> the Americans are going or not going to do. And, you know, as each day passes, you know, you pick it up on your mobile phone or the Internet or wherever, there are increasing saber rattling threats coming from Iran, coming from Syria. You know, if you do this, this is what we're going to do. Just this morning, one Syrian MP ha- has said that if the United States attacks uh, Syria, then either she or her her allies, Hezbollah, Iran, most certainly will attack U.S. bases, you know, dotted around the Middle East, will attack Israel. So it, it just ratchets up the tension. And we need to be in prayer for Bibi Netanyahu, his whole government, particularly, but particularly the security cabinet and those that are advising them, you know, on what they need to be prepared to do in the face of this, what is becoming, sadly, uh, a very increasingly strong and real threat to Israel, Israel's security at the present time. Yeah. Uh, and somewhere I want to bring you back in this one, going back to that uh, very fateful war of uh, 1973, um, there were incredible intelligence failures, and I think there was a, 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 a commission uh, after the war of 1973 uh, in which uh, the Israeli Prime Minister then, Golda Meir, resigned. Uh, what were some of the intelligence failures, and why wasn't Israel prepared for this war? And was it complacency because of Israel's great victory she achieved in the uh, 1967 war, the Six Day War? Well, we were used to seeing, after 67, Arabs running away from war, leaving their shoes in the desert. So there was a great deal of complacency. I wouldn't call it hubris, I would call it complacency. Um, And by that time, we had got a lot of strategic depth, remember. We got our Golan Heights, Mm -hmm. and we had the Sinai Peninsula. So there was a feeling of indestructibility at that time, that Mm -hmm. whatever happened, we would have lots and lots of advance warning. And let's face it, the Egyptians had to cross the Suez Canal as well. So uh, they were taken by surprise. But even when the intelligence information filtered through, there was this reluctance under American pressure and then Kissinger was very, very deeply involved in this, um, to preemptively strike. Um, and I think this is a problem that we even have today mm-hmm. in regard to Iran, in regard to whatever we want to do. Mm-hmm. What will America think? I think at the end of the day, um, Israel has to do what its leaders and generals feel is necessary to protect the state of Israel, mm-hmm. especially if we've now that we've given up a lot of the strategic depth, we don't have the Sinai Peninsula any longer. Mm-hmm. And we have a different kind of war today. You know, we had a hundred and God knows how many planes c- taken down by the SAM missiles, which was the surface to air missiles, which Russia supplied mm-hmm. um, to, uh, to uh, Egypt. Um, but today they are going to be ground to ground missiles, the 10,000, the 30,000 missiles that Hezbollah um, have got um, targeted against Israel. Now, I look at it today and I see that we are supposed to have twice as many Iron Dome batteries today than we have. Mm -hmm. We've deployed the sixth one, but Ehud Barak said there would be 12 by now. And that worries me because that is going, this is not going to be a tank war Mm -hmm. next time. It's going to be a missile war. And unless we have got all the resources, and let's face it, we have the resources. We invented the Iron Dome. And if they've got you know, 10 crews working overnight, they should have 20 crews working overnight Mm -hmm. to protect the people. So I think there is a lot of complacency still there. um, And I think it's dangerous. And uh, we've got another clip to go to now and uh, another clip that looks at God's incredible hand of protection during the uh, Yom Kippur War. 73, you go into battle again as a commander, right? Tell me what happened to you in that war. 
was a uh, hard combat in the Goran Heights. We uh, we lost uh, two turrets from the Goran Heights after uh, less than 24 hours. My mission was to protect the area against the Syrian, and it was hard. We fought for uh, four days from uh, Shabbat, is uh, Yom Kippur, uh, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And the hardest day it was uh, during uh, during Tuesday that we almost lost the combat. Kalani is given an order by Janusz, his commander, to stand his ground in the valley below their position. He has only seven tanks left to face the Syrian armada. But when Janusz asks Kahalani over the radio how many tanks he has, he answers 41, just in case the enemy was listening in, he later admits. What happened to you that day? Usually when you shoot with tanks, it's, uh, it's a range two miles. I had a situation that I found four tanks in the front of me, 25 meters, and I was alone. I scream on my gun and shoot him! Yes, 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 yes. And he didn't know what to do. It was so close to him. I thought I'm gonna kill him. <laughs> I moved to another tank, and my loader put another shell, and he shot again. And when I put the, the main gun to the third one, I saw the uh, main gun of the Syrian tank look straight to my face. He's ready to shoot. And my gunner was screaming, yelling. I saw the 115 millimeter look straight to my eyes and he was ready. kind of uh, a situation how we fought on the Golan Heights during the Yom Kippur. The battle for the Golan will ultimately come down to this final confrontation at a hilltop called Little Khermon and the valley below it that will be known forever after as the Vale of Tears. If the Syrians make it past this point, nothing will stop them from storming across the Galilee, destroying Tiberias, Haifa, and ultimately Tel Aviv. Kahalani's remaining tanks have all taken Syrian hits. Many have lost commanders or whole crews. Command discipline is low. Morale is failing. Defeat is in the air. Kahalani gives an order to his tank commanders to move forward. No one moves. He tries cajoling them, even starting forward himself. No other tank follows. Kahalani had faced death in 1967 and survived, just as David had once faced down a bear and a lion that attacked his sheep. Both young men refused to bow to fear. David stepped up to face Goliath. Kahalani ordered his tank to move forward. David had declared, I come not with sword and shield, but in the name of the God of Israel. He carried only five stones into battle with his giant. Kahalani moves forward with only seven tanks to face the massive Syrian armada. Kahalani's crippled tanks storm the hill before them, looking down at the once green valley, now blackened with the smoldering remains of hundreds of burning Syrian and Israeli tanks from three days of fierce fighting. Moving among them, hundreds of Syrian tanks continue their relentless advance. Kahalani orders his tanks to begin a barrage of gunfire on the advancing armada below, not expecting to stop them, but at least hoping to slow their advance long enough for reinforcements to arrive. Reinforcements don't come, but suddenly, to his amazement and without explanation, the Syrians seem struck with fear. The enemy armada begins retreating, 
Syrian soldiers begin running from the battlefield in all directions. While Kahalani and his fellow soldiers are holding back the Syrian advance, they have no idea that they're part of another chain of events unfolding thousands of miles away from the battlefield that many say is the real miracle story of this war. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, in turning down Golda Meir's request for arms to defend her country, is reported to have said, let the Israelis bleed a little. Golda Meir is desperate. Without help, Israel will not survive many more days of the pounding assault from all sides, despite all the Kahalanis and those like him who are bravely defending their homeland and sacrificing their lives on all the front lines. And so she picks up the phone and calls the private line of U.S. President Richard Nixon. It is 3 o'clock in the morning. Television film producer and documentarian Bill McKay's investigation of the American role in the Yom Kippur War describes what happened when President Nixon took Golda Meir's call in the middle of the night. Mr. President, if you don't help us, the Jewish people will never survive. He said something interesting, if not strange. He said, you know, I could almost hear my mother's voice. She would tell me stories and read to me from the Old Testament, the heroes of the Bible. And one afternoon she said, Richard, someday you're going to be in a position where you can help save the Jewish people. And when that day comes, you must do everything in your power. And he said at that moment I realized, maybe for the first time in my presidency, why I had become president of the United States. It was the largest airlift of armaments since World War II. The president kept his word. Everything Golda asked for, she got. Every weapon, every vehicle, every piece of equipment, and all the ammunition to operate them. A virtual arsenal airlifted overnight to Israel's front lines. Many military experts credit that decision, that request, at that moment, as the essential element that saved Israel from destruction. In another striking parallel to David in the Bible, Richard Nixon turned aside the Goliath of indifference to Israel in his government, faced down a powerful Secretary of State who would turn against him, and accepted the threat to his own presidency to save Israel in its hour of need. Before it was over, the Yom Kippur War demonstrated one of the most incredible turnaround victories ever recorded in military history. For his bravery and valor in the Veil of Tears, Avigdor Kahalani was dubbed a hero of Israel received the nation's highest accolade for courage in the defense of his country. He would only say that his men fought well and that it was a miracle that saved Israel that day. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. And it's, uh, it's great to look back at history and see the hand of God's protection and also deliverance. And it gives us a lot of hope today that God will continue to do the same for Israel and the Jewish people. Um, Zalmi, uh, here we have an incredibly brave uh, Israeli tank commander who very much had the attitude like David of facing Goliath. I mean, facing incredibly overwhelming odds and attacking the whole Syrian armada by himself. What does that say about... Um, uh, so many Israeli soldiers and the Jewish connection to the land of Israel that gives them this supernatural strength to do the impossible. I, I, it may not answer your question, but looking at these clips makes me think about watching a 3D movie without 3D glasses. That everybody comes into the cinema and if they don't pick up the 3D glasses, they can't see very much of the film. They don't come out knowing what it's really all about. But the guy who goes in with the 3D glasses, mm -hmm. they will see in this context, the spiritualism, that there's a whole different dimension coming into play here. Mm -hmm. There are different forces working here. Mm -hmm. The seculars just won't look at it through those glasses. They choose not to wear them because they choose not to believe because it defies all of their secular and mm -hmm. philosophical um, arguments. Mm -hmm. But we do believe and we do see, and you've got to be, I mean, I've often said this to people, you've got to be blind, deaf and dumb, not to recognize that something special goes on mm -hmm. in that part, in that tiny country mm -hmm. um, that, yes, gives protection. And you know what? We also are 
73 was a lesson. Everything that happens there is a lesson for our survival. Mm -hmm. So 73 was saying, you can be surprised. You can, get, you can be overwhelmed. Don't be complacent. Mm -hmm. um, the fire in the Haifa Mountains, that mm -hmm. was a devastating thing. Mm -hmm. That literally could have consumed a great part of Israel with one match. Mm -hmm. Israel needed to learn that it had to get the equipment necessary, mm. the, you know, the, the, the tankers, to put out a fire if that happened in a war and one of the 30,000 missiles would set fire yeah. to the Carmel Mountain and, and mm. they would have, imagine fighting uh, half a country on fire in addition to fighting a war. Mm. That's another lesson. Everything for us is a lesson and it, the most important thing is that Israel's leaders have to learn each time from those lessons. And this recent Gaza um, missile war where the Iron Dome was deployed. We said, yes, the Iron Dome does work, but we need a lot more of them. Mm -hmm. Again, we have to follow the lessons. We are being shown the way to go, just like that minefield. Mm. <laughs> That's incredible. And uh, uh, Robin, uh, we, we have to really admire Richard Nixon. Um, we know that he was very much disgraced and he was yes. forced out of office because mm -hmm. of the Watergate scandal mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 1974, but he came to Israel's aid yes. and the aid of the Jewish people yes. in their hour of need. What yeah. does that say about Richard Nixon and what does that say about how God moves nations to protect his people? In some senses I think it probably says more about Richard Nixon's mother necessarily primarily than him but the fact that again you know it just it sends goosebumps up and down my spine just you know watching this and seeing this reminder of this period of history you know we have a God who knows the end from the beginning that's what the scriptures tell us so God knew that Richard Nixon needed to hear that from his mother in his early days and at that precise moment when Golda Meir knew Israel's back was against the wall that, that whatever persuasion she used triggered that memory and deep sown by God deep into Richard Nixon's heart and mind and soul and brought that to the surface at the most key moment in that conversation. And the same belief, yes. if I can interrupt, yes, please. that says that Nixon was put there at that moment in yes. history and Golda Meir was put at that yes. time in history. We must, by the same belief, accept that Obama is where he is today yeah. by divine providence. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's another warning for us. Yes because we have seen what Obama's done in the face of Syria. Mm -hmm. And we know that the same red line speak that he gave was with Iran as well. Mm -hmm. And we're being told, don't rely on anyone else mm -hmm. except yourself. Yeah. We are facing a <laughs> nuclear <laughs> annihilation threat. Yeah. I've put Obama there to yeah. show you what could happen yes. if push comes to shove. Yeah. And yeah. I believe that that is an important lesson as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other point, to, just to bring into this whole mix, is that we don't often get it that Israel has no choice. It's not as if, you know, another conflict and, and everything will, will be sorted out. You know, and when a flu, you lose a flu. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, th that guy in that tank brigade knew either I take this action, even if it costs me my life and the rest of these se six tank commanders with me, I have to try to stop this, whatever the cost, to me personally, because if these, the, these Syrian tanks get beyond this, it'll be a massacre. And Israel does not have the, the, the choice, the choice or, you know, to look, at, to look at plan B, plan C. There is only plan A, and that's, that is the, the deliverance of the nation, the protection of the nation. Absolutely. That's it, black and white. Down to less than uh, three minutes of the program, so it's gone very far. So okay. I just want to bring you uh, into this one, Zomi. Um, Israel went on to win that war in an incredible fashion um, and also moved deep into Syrian territory, I think only 20 miles from Damascus and mm. only 10 miles from Cairo. And yet Israel was denied the political victory that went with it, sadly. Um, what are the lessons that we can learn today from the Yom Kippur War? Well, I think the, the lessons that we, we, we learned at that time that it's the United Nations that's going to end wars, not like in 67. 67, we we worked for six days on the seventh day we rested and had won the war um, but in this case um, the united nations ended this war mm -hmm. and they have ended every subsequent war there mm -hmm. and i don't think that's the way israel needs to end wars mm -hmm. wars are there to be won mm -hmm. 
-hmm. not to be settled on mm -hmm. best terms, not, not in that part of the world. And the, I mean, just bringing the UN into that equation, they only stepped in when it looked like Israel actually was going to really yes. go for both Cairo and Damascus. Yes. They had held back and done nothing, said very Absolutely little nothing. up until the tide turned. Then all of a sudden they got interested and were putting the brakes on. So I think, you know, that again, you know, without being conspiracy theorists, that plays into the whole idea that the UN is not on Israel's side. And nothing changes in no. 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Okay, about uh, a minute 50 left of the program, guys. So, um, Zelmi, I'd like you to really sum up. Uh, the Yom Kippur War was a real fight for Israel's very survival. She faced incredibly overwhelming military odds, and yet she came on top. Um, doesn't this bring comfort to know that it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob today is still protecting his people and, your, and his land, which is Israel, um, in fulfillment of biblical prophecies, but also in fulfillment of the Torah and the Tanah. Absolutely, but by the same token, we have a tenet in the, in the Torah which basically says, en somchim ala nes, do not rely on miracles. Mm -hmm. We have to do our part. He also serves those yeah. who stand and wait. Yeah. So yeah. really, um, you know, it's, it's a joint effort. Yeah. But when the chips are down, we have a very strong ally, <laughs> more, far more powerful than, than the United States. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's good to know. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for joining me on uh, the Middle East Report today as we look back at the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And I want to thank you for watching today's programme. This is the uh, 40th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War of 1973. If it shows nothing else, it shows that God is the protector of Israel. God is the protector of the Jewish people. And during times of crisis, is, is the God of Israel comes to, to the protection of the Jewish people. So it's important that we continue to uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's, it's important that we continue to give Israel and the Jewish people a voice as we remember the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And as uh, we show in this final song, it was taken in uh, Sept sorry, it's taken in September 1972, a year before the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War. And many of the uh, soldiers featured in this clip would have lost their lives um, trying to defend the Jewish state against overwhelming odds. So let's pay tribute to the courage and the bravery of uh, Israel's soldiers who defend that precious land as we know as the land of Israel. Thank you for watching today's Middle East Report.